Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thanks to the AIT for organizing this event. And we are here to explore NRPSI, the National Register of Public Service Interpreters, what is it? And actually, just as importantly, what isn't it? So NRPSI, what it is and what it isn't. And within that, we will also look at its purpose, its vision for the future, the values that underpin everything that the National Register is about and its mission. In fact, <coughs> it's worth stating that the National Register consistently works with a strategy document which guides its, act its activity at any moment in time. The last strategy document was put together at the end of 2018 for the period from 2019 up to now. Uh, the board came together quite recently in September to draw up a draft new strategy document, which we should be in a position to release um, by December of this year. Today we have a, if you like, a, a, a look through the curtain as to where we've got to. There are some draft elements which for every one of us can guide us as to how it is the National Register sees the future developing and what's important. And perhaps one of the key elements here is to listen to the board directors and hear the board directors when they talk to us, when they themselves are talking about what is important and what isn't important and what it is that we do and what we don't do. Phil Muriel is the most recent practitioner board member having arrived earlier this year. And, and Phil is playing a, quite a key part in the next social media campaign. Some of you may have already seen it. It broke earlier this week uh, on LinkedIn and in Facebook, and it's been picked up by very, very many other organizations. And Phil was really clear um, when he was saying that there are many interpreters who've got a misconception of what it is NRPSI is. And he's, he states it. It's not an agency. It's not to find jobs. But it is to maintain to find jobs. A, to maintain a register of public service interpreters who meets the standards that have been set and that those standards are trusted and they're actually used then the register to actually find interpreters. So what's NRPSI? Well, what it isn't is an agency. Its role is not to find work. And according to the Professional Associations Research Network, there are approximately 400 professional bodies in the UK representing something like 13 million professionals. Many of them are associations, associations geared towards looking after their members and AIT is clearly one of them. And there are other associations within our ecosystem whose role it is to look after its members dependent on the nature of the criteria for membership. NRPSI is not an institute, it's not a learned institute. Learned institutes and societies, again, are for their members and also for guiding and for leading how ecosystems, professions should move forward. We are blessed uh, within our arena to have the CIOL and the ITI as learned institutions to act very much on behalf of their members. Again, let's just be very clear, this is not the role of the National Register. The National Register is one of the three other types of bodies that PAN identifies. It is a regulatory body and it regulates registrants who qualify. So if you are on NRPSI or NERPSI, you're not a member of NERPSI, you are a registrant, which means that you have achieved the qualifications that are necessary. You've achieved the experience level evidenced that you have signed up to the code of professional conduct and that you comply with everything that that regulatory body is there to carry through. Now, there are different types of regulatory bodies. There are those which are statutory and those which are 
independent. The majority of the regulators that Khan lists are independent regulators, as is the National Register. So that's who we are, and that's what we are in broad terms. But what is it that we actually do? Well, Lali is with us today. So, uh, Lalia, this is the beginning of your social media campaign. Uh, public service interpreters perform a very important role often communicating on matters of life and death. All practicing public service interpreters should therefore be qualified and regulated. It is important, it is vital that you, as a qualified and experienced interpreter, are actually registered and regulated to give confidence to the individual for whom you are operating and for the public sector organisation itself. And indeed, a very recently appointed chair who was involved with the launch of NRPSI back in the 1990s is ever so keen on ensuring that our strategy for the future captures everything that Lalia was talking about. Hi, and Madeline, Hello. Madeline Lee, who's been active for many years uh, in struggling for and fighting for uh, the protection of title for registered public service interpreters, again, is very clear. There's every reason why public services with their clear duty of care would want to use a registered and regulated interpreter. The question is not why would you, but why wouldn't you? And Nick Whitaker, who again has been on the board for a long time, he's uh, a Price, ex Price Waterhouse Coopers uh, partner. Uh, and from his perspective, as a lay board member, he absolutely understands the risks involved when things go wrong for organizations. And he's ever so clear as well. We need to ensure that those fulfilling the role of public service interpreter are properly qualified, registered, and regulated. So what's the purpose then of the National Register? Well, clearly it's a not-for-profit organization. <laughs> Excuse me. So as a not-for-profit organization, yes, of course, that means that it, it must cover its liabilities, but its purpose is not to build profit, to pay dividends to shareholders or to create shareholder value. It is 28 years of existence and as a standalone entity since um, 2011, the National Register's role is, is not about money. It's not about growth and shareholder value, but it's about excellence. It's about respect. And yes, let's make people happy. And as Charles Handy, who is a, a management guru, calls the best of organizations, organizations that have a soul are the best of all organizations. And the National Register is committed to that to having a soul that is anchored in integrity, there for a very specific purpose. And that purpose is to protect the public, to give voice to the voiceless. So before we really get started on the presentation, let's just look at a strategy definition about how do we go about sorting out what is the purpose of an organization? What is its vision? What are its values? How do we define its mission and its goals and its objectives? Well, strategy is about planning to maximize performance today. There's no point in planning just for tomorrow because you've got to get to tomorrow. So we have to understand where we are today. We've got to understand the nature of the resources that we have, the capacity of an organization to take on work, its competencies, competencies being skills and the experience and its aptitude, and thus the capabilities to achieve success, whatever the success is that we define in the future. So know where we are today, know where we want to be, and then how do we make that journey happen? <coughs> and adapting to the change through that journey requires that we actually operate in two time periods, kind of a time traveler when you're writing the strategy for an organization. Where are we now? Where do we want to be in the future? Now, we're going to take some time over this next slide because this underpins the very nature of 
what NRPSI is all about. And I make no excuse for this, but I'm going to read these paragraphs out as we go along. So the importance of professional practitioners in spoken language, public sector language services in the UK with a population of 67 million, we benefit from a multicultural society in which over 4 million people have languages other than English as their main language. And 27% of these regard their English skills as non-proficient. And that's from the 2011 census. We haven't got the 2021 census yet. What this means is that there's nearly a million people who do not regard their English skills as non-proficient. The number's like 900,000 plus. But let's call it a million. The role of the National Registry is to ensure that if and when those individuals have an interface with the public sector, the public service organisations involved should be turning to the organisation which registers and regulates those who are capable of carrying out the work. Now, what's interesting over the last few years is that actually there hasn't been a drop in, in the need for something like the National Register. The UK issued just over 277,000 work-related visas in the year ending March 2022. Big increase on March 2021, would not surprise by that because of COVID. But actually what is a surprise is that's 50% higher than the number of work-related visas which are issued when compared to March of 2020. <coughs> Excuse me, which is of course the start of COVID. So the number of individuals who will need voice given to them by a professional practitioner, public service interpreter, is actually going up. There is a continuing and increasing need for professionalism in the public sector spoken language services and ensuring effective regulation of those acting as interpreters and translators in potentially life-changing interactions with public services has never been more important. It has not gone away. Since the call for the National Register to come into being, its reason for being has actually increased rather than decreased. And of course, there are some people here today who were involved with the National Register at its conception. When the 1993 Runciman Royal Commission recommended the establishment of a registered public service interpreter so that only those who were trained and qualified, governed by a code of professional conduct, should be used in court. Those who are qualified and experienced who actually adhere to a code of professional conduct. In 1994, the National Register was established by the then Institute uh, of Chartered Linguists now the sorry, uh, Institute of Linguists, now the CIOL. And NERPSI became an independent, not-for-profit organization in 2011. There are those who say, look, anybody can set up a, a register. Well, yes, that's true. But the deep roots of the National Register are based on a calling to being by the judiciary due to miscarriages of justice, a Runciman Royal Commission recommending the establishment of a register, uh, the Nuffield Trust being part of the, the launch of the National Register under the auspices of the Institute of Linguists, now the Chartered Institute of Linguists. So its birth was incredibly clear, very transparent. And the fact that the National Register is a not-for-profit organisation, it is there purely and simply to serve the public and to serve the country is hugely important for every single person who's involved in some way with the National Register to focus on. So those core activities remain as relevant now, if not more so, as you've already said, than back in 1994. And the board, when it was spending time thinking about the strategy for uh, 2023 through to 2025, acknowledges that we need to be engaged with not just interpreters, but also with the users of the service. 
as well as extending the regulatory function across public service translation through an effective launch of NRPST. So in, an, in essence, that's it. But shall we delve a little bit deeper? I think we should. The reason being, not just the National Register, but everybody's experiencing unprecedented challenges in the environment. In many instances, the only constant is change and uncertainty. And that uncertainty is very dangerous. And we either develop or we fade. There is no status quo. So many organizations, companies have actually struggled through these last few years and will continue to struggle. Because things are not going to get much easier. And therefore, if the role of the National Register is that important, then we have to ensure that it is developing and it does not fade. And a lot of responsibility for that, of course, lies with the board. Of course, it lies with the secretariat at the National Register, but it also lies with every single registrant. And it also lies with all the other stakeholders too, the public sector organizations who must begin to recognize that to protect the public, they should only be engaging with registered and regulated, pub, uh, registered public service interpreters who abide by code of professional conduct. The environment we're in is very volatile. The environment that we're in is deeply uncertain. The environment that we're in is hugely unstable. The environment that we're in is massively complex. And there's so much ambiguity. My goodness, isn't there such? Uh, one of my favorite memes going around at the moment is the fact that we've had four chancellors of the Exchequer in the last four months, one every month. We are in a deeply volatile and uncertain place. And we have to make sure that we steer our ship and steer our, our vision through these difficult times. Our economy is deeply volatile. And indeed, for every single individual working in language services, huge volatility, massive levels of uncertainty, following the pandemic, walking straight into social, technological, economic, ecological, political, legal, and ethical factors, creating an even more uncertain world. We have an unstable social and economic environment, not just in the United Kingdom, but across the globe, but particularly in the UK. And indeed, there's a lack of overall focus on language services by the current UK government and the previous UK government ever since austerity came back in, in 2012. And that's influencing public sector organizations and how they approach language services. So we have to work incredibly hard at, at, at talking to government, at talking to the cabinet office, at talking uh, yeah. Sorry about this. Uh, uh, talking to um, organizations and the need to influence so many varied and different individuals. And then we have ambiguity affecting us. One of the joys of being at the National Register is that the Professional Interpreters for Justice Consortium, the members, come together because they are committed to professionalism in public service interpreters. But each individual organization has its own agendas. The ITI, very conference orientated and commercial orientated, brings so much to the party, not just focused on public service interpreting, also interpret on conference interpreting and, and on translation generally. The Chartered Institute of Linguists, from an overall linguist perspective, including academics. The Association of Police and Court Interpreters go through leadership changes. Our union, NUPIT's activities, and indeed two other organizations which are going through leadership changes, the Welsh, National, uh, the Welsh Language Organization and the NRCPD. So we're on shifting sands in terms of the outside world. And, We've got social threats, we've got technological threats, we've got economic factors influencing us, ecological issues too, massive political influence, legal constraints, and ethical values. Some of these have got a, 
uh, a big impact and a big immediacy and a big importance, high, medium or low. And all of this we have to take into account when we're focusing on what is the vision for the National Register, what is the vision for our profession of public service interpreting. Socially, high level of importance, high impact levels of upheavals caused by austerity, pandemic, living expenses, and rampant inflation rates. Technology, as a national register, we are dependent on one supplier, uh, and that's a fiscal issue. Um, the one supplier has stood as in very good stead, but it is an issue that we need to be focused on. The volatile economic environment is of very high importance. Money's tight. It's affecting the public sector, but it's also affecting your pockets as, as registrants. It's affecting your pockets as public service interpreters. We are not blessed with a government, nor indeed the last government, which embraced a, an ethical foundation. They, the governments that we've, we've recently had uh, melt standards like sugar cubes in hot tea. And we have to struggle against that and work against that. We have to fight against this current unsuitable political environment to ensure that the aims of the National Register actually get onto their agenda. We've had the barristers on strike, they are coming back. Court cases delayed and backlogged, my goodness, so many of them. Police issues. It's fantastic that the police have accepted through the pay scheme, that interpreters should have at least a level six qualification and 400 hours of experience. But we should also ensure that the levels of remuneration and the terms and conditions are fair. If somebody is in Exeter and they're expected to go to Truro for an engagement with the police, then their expenses and their travel time should be paid for particularly in these days with fuel costs being so high. Ecologically, we know that that's becoming more important around the globe, but it's less of an issue for us. But if you take those classic steeple issues, many of them are affecting where we are today, where we wish to be for the future. So the Vuica and the steeple factors we've just talked about, Government factors, we could get more specific. Each public sector has got a different view and we have to address each one. We know that the London Met Police only engage with people from the National Register in the first instance. We also know the NHS will actually suggest to people that they bring a family member in to interpret on their behalf. Notwithstanding the fact that NHS England states that actually Somebody from NRPSI with a DPSI health should be the first port of call. The agencies and, and the whole issue about outsourcing, that has to be addressed. It's a massive issue. Our current registrant base and the possible future registrants in terms of external influence. And of course, the complementary organizations, the stakeholders along which we work, such as the CIOL, the ITI, the APCI, the AIT here today. We've organized this opportunity for us uh, to meet up. Yeah, there's a new minister coming to government. So the call for the technical review for language services is in abeyance until the new minister gets beds in, uh, until the new minister beds in. There is a massive anti-regulatory ideology uh, with our, our current government. Uh, indeed, that has brought them quite some shocks over the last two weeks. And our court system is struggling. Complementary organisations, as we said, multiple stakeholders with different needs and priorities. The really good news is these stakeholders do come together and do actually get very focused on the need for registration, regulation, code of professional conduct. Let's just spend a little time on outsourcing. And again, I make no uh, apology for this, but we will read what's going to come up on this slide because it's really important. According to the House of Commons Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee, public trust in outsourcing has been seriously damaged. That's a quote from the House of Commons. 
The future of outsourcing is no longer whether it will go or stay, it's the extent to which it will continue to change the nature of public services and which public services should be outsourced. There are big reviews going on right now about outsourcing. The House of Commons Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee states, if the government wishes to continue with outsourcing, for particular services, it needs to rebuild trust in the process. <coughs> Excuse me. I believe there's very little trust right now in the process of outsourcing with public service interpreting. To rebuild trust in the process by which it makes decisions at a time when trust generally in the government is at an all time low. Isn't that the truth? Then we have to look at the internal di diagnosis. Do we have the right people? Have we got the right board of directors? Have we got the right secretariat? Are we using our time well? Are our actions and our processes as, as good as they could be? And my goodness, managing money. No one at the National Register knows this more than myself and, and, and indeed the whole of the secretariat. Every penny in the budgets of the National Register come from Registrar. Therefore, it is our responsibility to make sure every penny is well spent to maintain our drive against our goals and against our vision. The nature of the machineries that we have, the nature of materials that we use. So we need to understand these when we're talking about what is our vision for the future? What are our values? What's our mission to get there? As we bundle all these up, to create capabilities to drive for the future. You know, it's a little bit like, here's our current position, let's define where we want to be, but my goodness, we face resistance, we face chaos, we face changes in government and changes in the public sector. Transforming ideas come along to help things move forward, it begins to integrate and we achieve the vision. That's the aim. But it is a struggle. It's been a struggle for the whole life of, of the National Register, which got worse with austerity. Are we beginning to make headway? Can we actually achieve that which we want to achieve? Historically, public service interpreting was seen as an occupation. Didn't matter whether you had any qualifications at all, somebody who could sort of do the job. There was a recognition that it needed to be a budding profession. And this came to the fore back in 1993. And through that, a self-regulatory independent regulator was created and that's been operating since 1994, NRESI. Wider stakeholder group accepting the need for regulation and indeed we could wish for no more support than we get from all the different members of PI4J. Uh, and, and indeed, there are many people with DPSI level six who are not yet convinced of the need for regulation, who are not yet convinced of the need to be registered. And we should all be working towards bringing these people in to, to encourage the voice of NRPSI to make the voice louder in the corridors of power. We struggle against the public sector organizations where they say it's all about cost considerations, it's all about supply, which is why outsourcing exists. But actually the risks are high. And we need to expose the risks to government because that will drive government to get involved. And it's that that will lead to protection of title. And it's that that will lead to statutory recognition. <coughs> So this is giving you a broad sense of vision as to the path we're on, where we've got to, and where we still have to go. So our planning is define a purpose. We need to inspire people. We need to impact on the lives of all the stakeholders. That includes government. That includes the public sector. That includes every single other organization within our ecosystem. It includes everybody who could be on NRPSI as a registrant who isn't, as well as registrants themselves. And it's got to be real. We've got to believe that we can achieve it. We've got to feel it. And we have to really help people believe that, that it's achievable. Connecting head and heart, going back to that sense of what Charles Handy was talking about. 
ensuring that the heartbeat of the enterprise is tied to everything that is the purpose, a purpose which is greater than just NRPSI, that resonates, gives a sense of doing something worthwhile, like giving voice to the voiceless, like protecting those who need that protection. And the court of public opinion is, is long-term and it holds the keys to the organization's reputation. We have, to, every step we take, has to be very positive to ensure that we're impacting on stakeholders. So this is the planning that underpins the purpose of the National Register. And it's through that purpose that we can look at the competencies and the capabilities contributing to the execution of our goals. What's our vision to achieve the purpose? What are the values underpinning us? What's our mission today? What are the broad goals, specific objectives, and then the key performance indicators for everybody involved? And when I say everybody, I don't just mean the staff of NRPSI. I don't just mean the board. I mean every single registrant. And I mean every single individual in the world of public service interpreters. We should all have these personal key performance indicators for ourselves as we move forward to achieve the objectives that we want to achieve. Vision. Where do we want to get to values? How do we do it? Mission, what are we doing right now to do it? Is the vision likely to inspire and infuse? Is it future orientated? Is it guiding us to a better future? Is it very clear? Is it very understandable? Are we likely to encourage commitment from all the stakeholders we've been talking about? Is it ambitious enough? Can it be verified? Is it appropriate? Does it fit with the history where we've come from? No. no uh, argument here that the previous strategy must must help us guide with the next strategy and the last strategy document was published it, it was available it was uh, published back in december of 2018 and it is that which has been underpinning how we move forward into the future given what's been going on over the last few years does the vision set standards of excellence reflect high ethical standards Clarify the purpose that we've talked about. Clarify the direction of travel. Does it reflect a uniqueness? And it should do. There should be only one regulator and register of public service interpreters in the UK. Are values shared? Are the values that we put down the ones that everybody who is working alongside, with, and part of the National Register, do they share these values? Is it authentic? Is it believable? Do the values actually affect us on day-to-day -day behavior? Does our code of professional conduct actually guide us for every day? Does it integrate into where we want to be? Do our values integrate? Do they influence our decision-making? Core values, guiding principles, institutional ethics, probity, purity, code of professional conduct, absolutely. Aspirational values, we don't yet possess it, but aspire. My goodness, don't we all wish for uh, a, a protection of title and statutory recognition. Permission to play, social, behavioral, cultural values. Here's permission to play. It's a chance for us to gather today to discuss transparently key issues and to understand all our roles in driving for that which is most important. Recognition of your professionalism, recognition of your status, recognition of the need for professionalism. And those accidental values, norms that become the ways in which our, our organization operates. I'll give you one very good example of that in the last few years. We, we started the uh, evening events, their town halls, as a reaction to um, COVID to bring people together. Uh, and in the depths of COVID, it's very valuable, and we've continued it. It's become an accidental value that once a quarter, the National Register creates an opportunity for registrants to come together and to share in a enclosed environment where there's no chance of information to, to leak out either through video uh, and, and the only people who come in are those who are registrants. So then the mission, that which we do today, active. When we write it, should be in the present tense. It's not future orientated. We need to truly capture our activity why NRPSA exists and who are the stakeholders. We've got to ensure that the right person is in the right place with the right skills, with the right tasks at the right time, in the right way, at the right cost. 
clearly wanting to manage the renewal fees, for instance. You know, the renewal fee was put up in 2019 and then only again in 2022. And at, at half the inflation rate. Why? Because we were slicing into our cost base through the pandemic to ensure that we could manage the future life of the National Register for each individual registrant at the lowest possible renewal free and registration fee. And we want to uh, do all this to achieve the right goals. And this guy, Peter Drop, is another management consultant, and he says it beautifully. He says, when you set goals, they're not fate, they're direction, they're not commands. Goals are commitments. They do not determine the future, but they are the means where we can mobilize that which we are, our resources, our capabilities, and our energies for the making of that future. So defining vision is really, really important. And let's just remind ourselves of what goals are. Goals are broad. Goals are general intentions. Goals are intangibles. Goals are, goals are abstract. And goals are actually generally difficult to measure. Once you've set the goals, you then set the objectives. And the objectives are specific, they're precise, they're tangible, they're concrete, and they're measurable. So what we're going to do today is, is take through the process to look as far as goals, because these are only drafts right now. The board has to ratify these. Uh, there could well be one or two changes, and then we will publish the goals, the mission, the values, the vision, and the purpose, and set the objectives for driving this forward. You know, there are so many things that we're concerned about. But there's actually only so much that we can influence. If what we do is focus on those areas of concern without looking at the areas of influence, we are then very reactive. What we have to do is to push outwards against those things which we can change. And that's been very much part of the National Register's activity in the last two years, which is why we've seen changes in pace which is why Crown Commercial Services, for the first time ever in their framework, took the NRPSI Code of Professional Conduct. <coughs> and why we are waiting for the results of an independent technical review of qualifications and experience needed by the courts, and a policy review of the same, and an outsourcing review. Because we're working into those areas where we can begin to actually influence them. Our purpose and vision, where we want to be. Our values, what's important to us. Our mission, what we currently do. The strategy, how we're going to go about it. Aligning with each other, creating synergy where we work together with objectives which are, are smart and are scored so that we can actually activate action plans on what needs to be done with those objectives that I talked about. Delight our stakeholders, just as importantly, delight registrants to show personal growth for everybody involved, efficient and effective processes and motivated and prepared people so that our purpose and vision is for public consumption, they can see it. Our values are the glue which holds us together. We, we are positive about where we are today and we are challenging our future that we plan, we react, ploy, we create patterns for the future, our positioning, how we're perceived. We always be, uh, bear the strategy in mind. We, we begin creating much smarter goals for positive governance, and we begin creating action plans to drive us for the next three year period, which means that the personal objectives will tackle our weaknesses as an organization and develop us for the future. And our aim, clearly, then is to achieve those goals that we set, which we'll be coming on to very shortly. So the six P's of strategy, we plan, we react to situations, ploy, we create patterns where we can move forward. We, we really concentrate on our positioning as a national register, how we're perceived outside and then perform. Sounds good, sounds fantastic. It's a very clear plan. Mission today, values tomorrow, certain, uh, a vision for the future, values to guide us on the journey to achieve our purpose. The realities are it looks more like this. 
it's up and it's down and you go backwards and then you find things that upset you or disturb you, things that you hadn't seen. We've already had that experience, very many, very many here in, in, um, uh, on, on, on this webinar today. I've experienced much of that since 2012 and much indeed between 1994 and 2012. But let's not lose sight of that vision. Uh, and, and let's understand what the vision is, the draft that we're looking at right now, uh, to see whether or not that's actually going to help us to achieve our core aims of statutory recognition, making it mandatory for only registered and regular, and that we ensure that the profession and that professionals are recognized and are by public sector organizations. We need to protect the public. We need to set, maintain standards. We may need to continue to confirm relevant vocational qualifications, accredit competencies gained through experiences which are proven, which are evidenced. We need to measure degrees of competence through proportionate accountability accountable, consistent, transparent, and targeted disciplinary processes. We have to protect the practitioner. We have to promote that code of professional conduct, lobby for, for protection of title, and, uh, and actually support, as individuals, we need to support the regulator and registered professionals, ensuring visibility of you, those who are registered on the uh, national register. The extent to which government will change depends on necessity. We have self-regulated as a profession. We've set standards to design, design to ensure the quality of practice and accredit those who are fit to practice. We have to drive political necessity for the recognition that we need. Self-regulation comes first. It did for doctors, it did for nurses, it did for teachers. It's for every profession, self-regulation comes first, which is why there are more independent regulators than there are statutory regulators. But we have to really drive hard so that that balance of cost and supply, which is in the mind of public sector and in the mind of government, the number one thing is it's quality. It's quality which should drive government action, not cost and not supply. No regulation, it's an occupation. In our budding profession, we're talking about pre-1993. Limited regulation, nascent budding profession, launched 1994. Public interest merits greater regulation. Stakeholders coming together to support the, the work of NRPSI. Self-regulation by the profession, so much so that we've gained mandatory engagement already in some sectors. And we've gained an acceptance of some of the standards that underpin our profession in other sectors. And we have to drive for statutory regulation. It's a journey, it's an arc of history. This arc of history has been followed by so many other professions. We're not different from that point of view. It's the speed at which we arrive. The speed at which we arrive will depend on our voice, on how loud we are, where we speak, and the number of those who are registered and regulated with NRPSI. Everyone's moving forward together, then success will take care of itself and it will come quicker. So, the purpose of NRPSI. The draft that we've accepted so far with the board is creating, maintaining, upholding, raising, developing and promoting standards in public sector language services. Caring for those who achieve the status of regulated and registered public service spoken language professional practitioners. Protecting the public, which needs the services of a language professional by providing access to regulated and registered professionals. That's our purpose. These are the three core purposes of the National Register that's appearing in our draft, which the board will now uh, address, and then we should be in a position to, um, to, to publish in, in December. The board has already 
work together for a, a good number of sessions to actually come up with creating, caring, and protecting in these three key platforms. And in terms of the vision, to secure recognition for the organization as the expert, independent, strategic resource for government, the public sector, and linked private sector in setting standards for language services delivery. It's happening. As I said, Crown Commercial Services taking the Code of Professional Conduct. The police for the paid scheme, taking the stipulation about level six and about uh, 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 the, um, the experience levels of 400 hours. There's still a lot more to do. To secure public sector organizations are mandated to only engage with regulated and registered professional language service practitioners. My goodness, there's a long journey here. I'll give you an example just this week. The NHS, one of our employees was invited by the NHS to a doctor's appointment with her father to act as an interpreter on their behalf in a consultation. Now, this employee is not an interpreter. This employee has no qualifications. This employee does not have level six, she has qualifications, master's degree, bachelor degree, but not vocational in the world of interpreting. How bad was that? An amazing example of the work that we still need to, to do. To secure the following for regulated and registered public service language professionals, protection of title, achieving statutory recognition, the status of practitioners is valued by government, really important. Valued by the public sector organizations, really important, as well as related private entities such as solicitor firms. And attaining appropriate remuneration terms and conditions, commensurate with the qualification and experience of regulated and registered practitioners to protect standards of language service delivery, protecting those who need it most, giving voice to the voiceless. As a regulator, our role is to protect standards. If individuals are being underpaid and the terms and conditions are so tough that it's driving people away from the profession, then the regulator has to step in. It's not about each individual contract for each individual engagement, but it's about raising the base levels of remuneration ensuring terms and conditions are commensurate with your status, given your qualifications and your experience levels. And the values, confidence, inspiring and motivating all stakeholders, delivering satisfactorily, delighting those who deal with the organization with nursing and wherever possible, creating excitement about regulation and registration of professionals engaged in public sector language services. Let's get the public sector excited about the idea of only engaging with those who are registered and regulated rather than going for the cheapest route. Consistency, that we reliably deliver high quality services in a transparent manner for any and all who have a touch point with the National Register. And our commitment, respecting people, cultures and all stakeholders maintaining strong social and environmental responsibilities, especially to the management of registrants' funds invested in the management of the registers that exist within an NRPSI, and compliance, acting with integrity, honesty, and openness, always adhering to proper ethical and moral standards in all aspects of the organization's activities, absolute transparency. And therefore, the mission across the UK, review and determine standards required for registration, recognise the required qualifications and experience levels, secure the procedures which protect required standards, maintain the publicly and freely accessible registers, that includes NRPST, promote our role to government and public sector organisations and to other countries where possible. In fact, <coughs> only on Monday this week, we were presenting with the Ministry of Justice about the absolute vital need for regulation 
in language services within the Ministry of Justice. Promote the services of registrants to the public sector and related private entities. This is difficult because it demands a great deal of money. But there has to be ways to do it without spending great deals of money. And that we are taking, we are beginning to do that with the social media campaigns, with encouraging registrants to do more. Um, I, I, the campaign in 2021 of encouraging registrants to write to their MPs and writing the pro forma letters. It was because of that pressure that the Ministry of Justice ended up having to set up the independent technical review. And that was all about promotion of the services of registrants in a broader environment. Uh, promote continuous professional development for, for practitioners. Uh, and I have to say with the AIT, we are currently sitting with an organization that has really taken this to heart. Uh, I, I, the level and the amount of CPD created from AIT is, is exceptional uh, and, and deserves praise. Promote the need for regulation and registration amongst possible new registrants for the register, absolutely. Manage a robust, proportionate, fit to practice complaint service based on proportionate, accountable, consistent, transparent, and targeted platforms. Manage the organization effectively and sustainably. Ensure there's long life. And work alongside other organizations, such as those in PI4J, which share purpose, vision, and values. And that then leads to our goals. Maintain sustainability of the organization. Review and develop the code of professional conduct. Review procedures for handling complaints. Secure the future for our fledgling new starter, NRPST, as well as grow NERPSI. Embed the organization's delivery across the UK. Build on dialogue with the registrants and extra services where applicable, such as all the work we did with MPPV3 to get the changes we've got to so far, and let's see what more we can achieve. Promote more effectively across all the media platforms. Again, can I just state money? Costs money to promote unless you can find free ways to do it. And, and that's really important. We become active across all tiers of interpreting and translating. Look at level three. We, there's a, there's a, a dynamic for the need for registration and regulation of level three, totally separate to, to NERPC and level six. And let's see where, where we can play a part in making sure that happens. Continue effective dialogue with public sector organizations, develop on that dialogue uh, with executive and legis legislative functions in the UK. Open doors at the cabinet office so they don't slam the doors on us. Open the doors at central government. Secure protection of title for public service language professionals. Lobby for statutory regulation for public service language professionals to be engaged with. And lobby to attain appropriate remuneration terms and conditions commensurate with the qualifications and experience of you, regulated and registered practitioners. And if you're not a regulated and registered practitioner, I do hope that our time today has encouraged you to actually explore how you can become a registrant and let your voice be amplified in the corridors of power to achieve that which we wish to achieve. Not your opinion that matters. It's what you do. It's what you do. It's what you seem to be doing. Paolo Coelho, an amazing thinker. Um, my favorite quote from him. The world is changed by your example, not by your opinion. So find ways to be part of this general drive to achieve the vision and to hit the purpose for NRPSI as it drives to give voice to the voiceless and protect registrants. Peter Drucker, magnificent management consultant, only three things happen naturally in organizations, friction, confusion, underperformance, fighting internally. Everything else requires leadership. And each and every one of you has shown yourself to be a leader today by coming along. Each and every one of you has leadership responsibilities in terms of ensuring that the drive for purpose, the drive for the vision, 
that we believe is the right vision for NRPSI. Each one of you is a leader in that work. Uh, we hope, as I've said earlier, to be able to publish the strategy document in December. You've had a preview, a behind the curtains look. It is a development of that which was published in December of 2018, which is currently on um, the NERPSI website. Uh, and I want to thank you for it. I want to thank you for putting up with my voice and coughs. And also, actually, I do apologize for the call that came through. There's only one person that can put a call straight through to me when the phone is, is actually um, uh, on block, and that's my wife. So clearly, one thing I shall be doing shortly is calling my wife back. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for bearing with us. And it's my job now to pass back to Irina and the AIT while I have a sip of water and then come back in, in a couple of minutes. Thank you very much indeed.